The Hiawatha Woodturning Club is an affiliate club of the American Association of Woodturners. Woodturning can be a dangerous endeavor. We encourage you to seek out training from experienced trainers like those that can be found at an affiliate club of the American Association of Woodturners. This spindle across the top right here came from Mackinac Island and they wanted a dozen of them made for the lumber yard in St. Ignace. So they drop this off over there. The guys look in their book of spindles that they can order. They, they don't find this one in this length or whatever and they call me and say, can you do a dozen of these? And my first question is how many do they want and when do they want it? You know, and what do they want it made out of? Local cedar or western cedar or is it going inside a house? Is it birch? or so until I know if it fits in my schedule, I don't take the job, I go look at it. And uh, then I give them a price and I never go below $15 a spindle. Never. It's usually 20 And um, I don't, I shy away from anything over 30 or 40 of them. I just don't want that tedium of trying to make 30 or 40 alike. So this is a, a job for a dozen of these and I had six weeks to do it. So whenever it's raining and I'm not doing other work, I'll go in the shop and I'll turn three or four of these in the morning and try not to get wore out doing it. Um, but this is a setup that I use behind my lathe. I have a shopsmith that was my dad's and I screw this to the bench that the shopsmith is on. So this, the spindle I'm turning is directly behind the one you're seeing here so that I can visually look at the original and look at the one I'm turning. Um, so if the club lathe is right here if I would have that mounted just like this, right behind what I'm going to be turning, so that I can visually look, and uh, it really, really helps. Okay. So this is the first one that I turned to match. Okay, and they're going to get cut off at both ends on an angle because they're on a, st a below stairway railing. So that's my attempt to match it up, and. Um, I guess I prepared the stock, I laminated enough wood, uh, western cedar clear to get the right size square uh, piece of stock. And um, then I, once I laminated 14 of those or so, this was what they looked like. And it's pretty hard to see the glue joint in this. There's three, three laminations there. And if you do a good job on the joiner and the planer, plenty of clamps. It's pretty hard to see the glue joint. You can see it better on this one. If I can get it up here or not. Oop, wrong way. But you can kind of see a little striping on the ends there. But it's pretty good, the glue joints. And then I would take the original and lay it on one of these. And I end up with a series of marks, which I hope you can see here. We seeing them, Tom? And those are the layout marks for the key diameters, the places where I need to make beads and coves. Uh, it's a series of, of lines. So I have all these on my workbench all lined up, all 14 of them, and I use a big framing square and just transfer those lines with an ink pen across all of the ones I need to do. Okay, so that's basically how I get ready to do 12 of these or 14 of these as I um, would start out with a stock. Well, so far, most of these have been outdoor turnings that are going to get painted. So I use a good waterproof glue, okay, because it's important. If they're for interior, I would try to get full thickness wood so there's no laminations, especially if they're going to stain and varnish them. You'd see all the layers of wood, and I don't think it would be too good. But um, so far, they've all been outdoor stuff that's rotted, and that's why I'm getting, their, you know, why they need replacements, because they're rotting in the weather. And the local contractors seem to think that the western outlasts local cedar. I'm not so sure. I think oh, it, it does. Yeah. Uh, I think it's just how the water drains off the piece and how well installed and all of that. It's really difficult to turn the stuff the lumberyard tried to give me, this is a 2x4 from the lumberyard. And you can see, it's uh, if you looked at the end grain of it, it's got the 
center of the log in it, and it's got some knots. This just it's kind of hard to turn spindles when you get a bunch of little knots like that. They don't, you know, grabs a tool and and the growth rings on this tree are really large. It grew really fast, and so the density is different. It's winter and summer wood. This is some uh, western they got me that was clear. It was absolutely beautiful stuff, all quarter sod, and really nice to work with. And so if I had my choice, I would ask for clear quarter sawn western, and either in the size you need or laminate it. And I don't really have a problem with either one. But I find that uh, in my blank prep, in my cheat sheet. I use Type Bond 3. It's the, the waterproof version of Type Bond. You can use a, a Gorilla Glue. You can use epoxies. All those work just fine. Well, as long as you do a good job on the joiner, there should be no gaps to fill. You know, all of that. Um, so, if you talk about spindle turning in general, I sort of divide it into three categories. One is if you're turning rocking chair spindles or chair parts or furniture parts. Um, the other one might be like outdoor spindles like I'm going to show today. And then another one might be baseball bats and rolling pins and other things like that. But the one thing spindle turning has uh, across the board is the grain of the wood is running the long way of the lathe. So you, whenever possible, you try to cut downhill in both directions from a bead, for instance, you're you're cutting downhill. You don't want to cut uphill. So from large diameter to small diameter, whenever possible. And in some of the turning books, can we see this thing? Where's that camera? Right there. Oh, that one. Okay. Is that better? Good. Okay. So that's what I mean when I say you're cutting downhill. So you're cutting from the large diameter to the small. And you'll find this diagram in all kinds of books. But that's important because uh, it really does cut down on the sanding time of what you need. Um, okay, so quarter sod, straight grain is the best. And I showed you some samples. Um, and when they want a square spindle, I take great pains in making sure it's square. You know, I run one, two surfaces through the joiner because you can actually... If you start out with a planer and run your wood through, it'll plane a banana curve into your wood. But if you start out with a joiner and make sure it's dead flat on two sides and at 90, then you can run it through the planer and you're going to get parallel straight stock. Okay. So the next step after you do that is to locate the centers. And here's two methods of uh, locating centers. Can you see those? Okay, one is just to draw a line from corner to corner and then take a scratch all or a drill and mark that middle. And the other one, you just set a tri-square a uh, little before or past center, which you think could draw parallel lines and then find the middle in there. So the better you locate that middle, the more your beads and stuff aren't going to have a flat spot on one side because you've, you've gotten it off a little bit. You're off center. That's kind of important to get centered up real good. And then the other thing you want to do is when you size your stock, you want it to come out similar to the original, but you also want to reduce your turning time by not making it oversized and having a lot of stock to, to turn away. So that's pretty important that you nail those uh, key diameters, you know, on this, that you have to have your square portion correct. And it, it takes a, a lot of turning away if you're really, really close to your, to your final size. Um, hardwood versus softwood. Obviously, the hardwood, I think, in some ways, it's stiffer. And if, you, if you're turning longer spindles, they don't tend to skip rope on you where they bend in the middle. And you want to watch how much tailstock pressure you apply because you can actually force the spindle into flexing in the middle a little more if you're too tight. And I think softwoods are harder to turn than hardwoods because you got to have your tools ground to a sharper point so the sharpness doesn't last as long because the point's tinier. It's more fragile, that metal tip. 
then if it's a more blunt grind, it'll last a little longer. And with softwood, if you don't have a really sharp edge and really steep angle, you know, a low angle of attack, you'll get some tear out on the end grain fibers and then there's more sanding. So I think in some ways it's easier to get a smoother surface off hardwoods than it is off softwoods. So I think this demonstration today on softwoods will be, uh, I have very sharp tools and hopefully I can just sand once at 80 grit and have them suitable for paint. That's my goal, is to have very little tear out, okay? Now as far as the lathe goes, when I spindle turn, normally the height of my lathe spindle right through here is at my elbow. So I adjust my lathe, my lathes in my shop are all set up at about elbow height with my elbow in the, in the spindle. But when I'm spindle turning, a lot of times I'm using a skew chisel to roll beads. I like my lathe a little lower for spindle turning and a little higher for bowl turning because I'm looking inside the bowl and I don't have to hunch over to look in there. And so that's a subtle difference for me. But I can spindle turn comfortably a little longer if I'm slightly below my elbow. The other difference of bowls and spindles, I think, is you spend less time with the tool handle against your hip where you're moving your hips from side to side in a bowl. On the spindle, it's a little more hand action and you're not freezing your shoulder and elbow joints as much. You're not doing the turner sway, I don't think, quite as much with spindle turning uh, versus bowl. So the other thing about the lathe is you want a lathe that can turn pretty fast. The smaller the diameter of the spindle, the more RPMs you want to use. So that surface speed of the wood coming around is high. So when you turn your lathe on, this one's at maximum speed, which is 3,900. You want to make sure the bearings are pretty good in your lathe, because if you have a wobbly bearings and they're clattering and stuff at high speed, that's going to transfer into your work. Um, so the lathe has to be pretty good, and your tool rest can't have a lot of nicks in the top of it, because you're moving the chisel quite a long ways. So you want to always take a file and file your rest maybe even uh, emery cloth it a little and put some wax on it. It really does help for spindle turning to have a smooth rest. And believe it or not, people don't like shops miss a whole lot. I inherited my dad's Mark V, but it is a fantastic spindle lathe because it has those four tubes and the tool rest carriage moves on those tubes. It only has a tool rest about eight inches long, but I can loosen up that carriage and slide it from one end to the other and it maintains parallel uh, very nicely so I don't have to keep releasing the banjo and moving it over and relocking it. It just stays right where I put it. And I don't even lock the thing. I just slide it over and do the right end and left. So as far as the lays, uh, having a long tool rest would help too if it was fairly long. Or I've even seen some people that have dedicated spindle lays where they have two tool rest bases like this and they have a very long tool rest with two posts. And it's just set up for nothing but that. <laughs> and you also can mark on the tool rest with magic markers or put a piece of masking tape on the tool rest or things like that for your key places. Um, so vibration is an issue. And then I think the biggest thing for me is having the original right behind the lathe so I can visually look at what I'm doing. You can also, it's right there. <coughs> you want to set a piece of caliper. It's mm -hmm. And I've seen <clears throat> even a production turning setup where it had a rod running across the back. It didn't have the original spindle, but it had a rod. And it had bent pieces of wire trapped on a threaded rod. And they all sat on top of the wood. And they started off with round cylinder in the middle. They roughed them all out round and square on the two ends. And those pieces of wire dropped through and fell straight down and hung when you hit the right diameter. So you can gear up for that, too. And there's pictures of that in some of the books that are here, how to make those things. But that's all I'm going to say about the lathe. And then, um, so again, you mark your, you want to mark your blank at the key locations. Here's, again, my quote key locations. Let's see if I can match this up. So, can you see those? 
So I've pre-marked where I want my beads and my coves and everything like that. And I'll go ahead and throw this one on the lathe. Make sure I get the right end here. and proceed to turn. Oh, she really goes, huh? Okay, so we start in the middle, right? Why not? Well, if we carve away a bunch of wood in the middle, we kind of weaken the middle. So I prefer to do the two ends first. Now, there are some turnings you'll do, spindle turning, where they're really long, and you'll need a steady rest in the middle, which is a, a hoop with a bunch of wheels that come in and it holds the middle from whipping. So be prepared for that if you, if you ever contract some long spindles or do some long ones. So I'm going to set, um, right now I'm going to set a caliper for either side of the bead. There's some flat spots. You guys see that okay? So I'm just going to set that caliper, a small one for that, and then I'm going to set a larger caliper for this one closer to the square end. And it helps to have a whole bunch of calipers, I found. How's that? See that? It just goes. So I've got two calipers set. And if I really wanted to, I don't have a third one, but I could set one for the beads themselves if I wanted to do that or set it here for the smallest diameter as well. But we're going to start off with turning that one and the same one at the opposite end, okay? And that's done with a parting tool. Um, this is the parting tool I use. And I use the longer end up. And you want to make sure that grind comes right to the diamond uh, point of the tool. So I'm going to turn it on. Hopefully you can see this, Tom. And just, just cut straight in. And after you cut in a ways, this won't be so lumpy after you get some of the square corners off, okay? And just keep cutting until it falls through and then stop. That's it. And I'm going to go to the opposite end. We're overhead now. Good. And the opposite end, I'm going to make that same cut. There it is. And then my next cut, over here. Okay, my next cut is going to be this bevel right here that leads to that. Remember I said I tend to work the two ends and keep the middle strong? So I'm using a uh, skew chisel. And I'm cutting in gradually with the skew. That's that in. I like the way he's doing that. Uh, I do mine the same way. Uh, that technique here that he's doing, he finds the whole piece. Yeah, long point down. You'd be surprised how many of these things you get that they want you to make one like it. And that is, you know, think about rain running down the spindle. You'd be surprised how many of these I get where that is not a curved downward surface right here at the base of the turning. And I look at them, no wonder they rotted out. You know, they're not a downhill. Okay, the next two I'm going to cut are the... Um, back to the overhead camera here. Next two are going to be here and here. And then at the opposite end of the spindle, there's these two. So those flats are my next cut. Again, with a parting tool. Just cut straight in. And these are a little smaller, so I'm going to wait to put the caliper in a little bit longer until I see that the first diameter. Then I'm going to put it in carefully and just, that's one, that's two, and again with the shopsmith I just slide the rest along, works pretty slick. So 
catch on those corners a little bit if you're not careful. So there's those diameters. And then I'm going to go to, I'm going to remove the wood between those two with a skew chisel. And I'm just going to use it as a peeling action. So I'm putting the, the tool flat on the rest and just bring it in and waste away that wood. I'm just going to stop when I still see a little shoulder there so that I don't lose that, that marking. I'm going to go over to the back to the other side and do the same thing. Now there's a very wide parting tool, it's called a bedan. And I could have used one of those or a square nose scraper just to go in and waste away that wood. It would have worked the same way. And my next step, again to the overhead camera, is going to be this little cove right in the middle between the two flats. And I don't know if you remember the diagram or not. But those little coves are both cut with a downward angle, this one right here. So I found this is a tiny little round nose scraper. It'll work. And you can actually, instead of having it flat across the top, you can angle it a little from both sides so that it actually cuts a little bit of a shear scrape. Or you can just go to a, this is a spindle gouge. I don't know if you guys can see that. See it? got a really nice long nose on it but this is what I'm going to cut mine with it's a spindle gouge so here's the first one so I'm cutting from my left to the middle and then from my right to the middle and trying to end up in the down in the bottom of it and end up with smooth results so I don't have to sand down in there much at all so when you get to the bottom, you have to stop. You can't keep coming up the other side. So that's that one. Go over and do this one. Those are done. Just eyeball them. Yeah, you could. You can set a caliper and check them. Um, don't really need to too much. Okay, going back to my original. If it was right here, I could easily look at it and see what I'm doing. But, um, okay, this is the way it goes. So on, on my right hand end, I've got two beads. And on my left hand end, I have one. So I'm going to roll the beads next. And uh, this one... On the right, I've got to relieve a little bit of wood there to be able to roll that bead. So I'll work at that some. We're going to start over here on the left with a single bead. And do this with a gouge, with a spindle gouge, if you're afraid of the skew chisel. But it's great practice to try to use the skew chisel, so I need to practice. And one of the first things you need to do is get it close. Uh, you can use any number of tools if you just take a, a spindle gouge and just waste away some of the wood before you try to roll the beads. That's an option, okay? And how do you know it's you got rid of the flat? You can shut it off and look, or you can just touch the tool without an edge, and you'll hear whether it's flat or not, whether you've achieved roundness. And when you have, you won't hear anything. It'll be pretty pretty flat. So that's the point at which you know you have roundness and you can now proceed to cut. So I'm going to use the short edge of the skew chisel, not the long tip. I'm going to start over on the edge and I'm just going to start rolling the skew over. So it starts out pretty much flat and ends up almost vertical. And I'm using the bottom corner, the short edge, to roll. And then I'm gonna still go the other way. And 
Now I've got a couple little flat spots still on that one, but not much. You can use the long tip to do the same thing, okay? But that's the bead. It looks pretty good. And it's shiny. It's uh, probably could start at 220 or less, uh, higher even grit than that. So going back to my original again, just set it on here. The next thing I need to do is whittle this down a little bit, and then I'm going to work at the other end before I make it slender in the middle. So again, I'm going to go to the skew and just start whittling that down. I'm using the long point down. When I look at my original, this surface right here is actually an outward curve, con convex. And right now I'm slightly concave on what I've got going. So I need to take a little more off on the left, on my left. So that's pretty much it. So now I'm going to go to the other end, and now we have two beads on this end, and I notice I've got a knot in the wood on this uh, right hand bead, sort of a knot on the other one, so it'll be a little more challenging. <laughs> and uh, if we wanted to, uh, we could make a cut here with a parting tool down close to that size, it would help some for rolling the bead. Or we could do a little cutting with the gouge. And right where that line is, I'm just going to cut a V going first one way and the other just to get, get some depth to that. And then I could take it down both of these where, where they're smooth. Still feel a little flat on there. They're there, but they're really tiny, so I think I'm almost round. I am. Okay, so back to the skew and using the short point of the tool again, round them down over. a slope right in here and then this whole middle part we need next so I'll go ahead and do those and that should be it and we'll work this with the skew on this end first compare to this original again So now I'm going to start working this middle, and uh, sometimes a little bit bigger tool helps, but you can also, with a bigger tool, it takes a bite as it's rotating, and when this gets slender, you have to take smaller bites, not bigger bites. So I can start off with a bigger tool, and I have a uh, roughing out gouge here. Oh, we're back on the other one. Oh, you're back? Okay. So this is just a roughing gouge, and it's it's a very blunt grind on this one. Um, 
and I'm probably going to use the side flutes a little. So I'm going to whittle down right in here and at this end try to match up. Okay, so Again, once this is round, it's not too uncomfortable to rub your fingers on it. And I usually wear a leather glove on this hand, and I reach under the tool rest to put my fingers lightly against the spindle, so that however much pressure I push on the tool is how much pressure I put on my fingers. I balance the two out, if you will. It takes away the vibration some, and as long as you're not aggressively pushing hard on the tool, you don't have to push hard with your fingers. So you kind of can have a very light touch on the tool and a very light touch on your leather fingers. And that is enough sometimes to control vibrations. And you also can put your hand on top this way as a vibration arrestor. Work back the other way. At some point I'll have to give up this large tool, but for now it works. It's always a good idea when you don't have the original uh, suspended there to stop and take a look, see how you're doing. So I'm at the critical diameter, I'm really close here, so I need more over in this area and then to smooth off this end. I think I'm going to work the two ends before I take any more out of the middle. I'm going to go back to the skew chisel here. And this time I'm going to use it long point down. I'm going to raise the rest just a little. The tool sits nice and flat. And so we want just a really nice outward convex curve on this end. I think I have more catches myself when I'm using this cue with a long point down because I let the cut come up. I always try to cut in the bottom one third of the tool when the long point is down. And I let the cut get higher than the midpoint and then it flips it over on me and grabs. So if you can always watch what you're doing and keep the cut on the bottom third of the tool, that probably won't be it. That's all I'm going to do on that end for right now. We'll go down to this end. Again, helps to compare and look. I think I got it backwards again. Yeah, I didn't bring mine. Or, yeah, I, I sometimes use a, a wide skew, a bigger skew chisel. Yep. Okay, so I'm not doing too bad here. This end looks pretty good in size. Got to take down in the middle, but I got to work on the right end just a little bit. Okay, there's a subtle, just happen to look again visually, there's a subtle change here. From this point into here, it's actually a downhill curve, it's an inward flowing concave curve from this point to here. So that's, I found skew is really hard to do that. It's, it's easier to do that with a gouge. And uh, I didn't bring, yes I did, I brought a large gouge which makes that quite a lot easier. So I'm going to use that to establish that concave. Stop 
again and look. It's got about the right curve. It's got a little flat spot right here that I need to get rid of. But that's about what I want. We can try to do it with this view. Might be fun, huh? There it is. The best cut's always just one little bit from disaster, right? sort of a rhythm, just a movement that develops. You get to know the shape quite well after the sixth or seventh one of trying to match that original. And it actually isn't bad. So let's see how we did. How's that look? This, this point here is definitely further toward the headstock than where mine is, so I could try to correct that a little bit. But otherwise, it looks pretty fair. to come over just a little bit too but it's awfully close okay so before I sand I want to I like you know it's just snazzy so this is a piece of bale wire so I just hold it on there get some friction and there's like little burrs in those corners and this kind of melts them all in and I don't have to get in there with sandpaper and mess with it so that didn't take long And then all I brought today was one piece of uh, 80 grit. So, so being these are being painted, that's about all it takes. So I kind of roll this into a round shape, just hit down in there just a little bit. They were pretty smooth to start with. I don't want to sand those shoulders. Nice and flat, sand those. Technique's good with a skew. Um, it shouldn't take a lot of uh, a lot of sanding to get the spindle, you know, close to your final shape and ready for paint. Now, if these were interior spindles that you want to stain and varnish, you might want to take them to you know 180, 120, something like that, where the scratches don't show as much. That is pretty much our turning, okay guys? See I got a little sharp point right there that I probably could take off with sandpaper. Yeah, question? Those marks right there? I would sand these flats with the orbital, you know, before I turn them out of the shop. Anyway, that's about as hard as I can make it. Sorry I didn't have a wicked catch for you. It would have been a lot of fun. What kind of great You know how many times. That's the whole purpose of stopping the light. Don't be afraid to shut that lathe off and check it before you go ahead. You wouldn't have had to shut it off near as much as that set behind it. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, here you go. 
think the one I just did still warm. <laughs>